And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. everybody welcome to nsf's live coverage from the cape of the project kuiper proto flight the first flight of two kuiper satellites from amazon launched by ula it's a very exciting day if you're an atlas 5 fan because it's only the second one we've had this year my name is ryan caton but it's not just my voice you'll be hearing for the next uh, hour or so as we count down to the launch in just under 60 minutes time alongside me for the uh, uh, to begin with is uh, alex how you doing alex I'm doing fantastic. We're going to see some mighty Atlas going up today, right? <laughs> only the, as I just said, only the second flight of Atlas of the year. It almost feels like we wait so long. We wait until the autumn for Atlas to finally fly and then two come at once. You wait for a bus, it takes forever and then two come at once. But, you know, finally we've got an, a second Atlas to enjoy and a daylight launch from Cape Canaveral, which with all the Starlinks going up as of late has become a little bit of a rarity. Uh, but we also, coming up later, have uh, Sawyer joining us. Uh, but uh, all of the crew have just started rolling out to the pad. Uh, so we'll be uh, uh, awaiting them, hopping on, getting cameras online and whatnot shortly. Uh, but we always have the robots uh, as well. And... Uh, controlling what you can see uh, in the background we have patrick pushing buttons doing all of the all of the magical streamy things making sure that these things go uh, so alex do you want to just give us a little bit of an update of how you and have been counting down so far they've just confirmed that uh, we are good for a launch so far in under an hour's time just under an hour's time but uh, how, how how's the actual rocket looking yeah, so right now the Atlas booster is completed uh, fueled with our RP-1 and Lucid Auction, so it is completely um, ready for flight in terms of propellant load. The Centaur upper stage is undergoing Lucid Auction and Lucid Hydrogen load right now as it you know approaches that usual T-4 minute hold uh, that is a planned hold that, um, that ULA does, you know how Atlas works. They do these sort of building holds that are about 30 minutes in duration. Um, so right now, even though you see there at the top of the screen, L minus 56 minutes, it is actually T minus 26 minutes right now, because you know once they reach T minus four, then they'll hold it for about 30 minutes and then get through the, through the end of the countdown. So, so far so good, it is looking pretty much good. Uh, we just got an update that the weather outlook has improved to 80% chance of, of acceptable conditions. For today's flight so hopefully today's flight should go on time in just 55 minutes and 41 seconds sounds good and i said just as we got underway here uh that we may also have a voice joining us from the field and sawyer rosenstein is with us how are you doing sawyer i'm doing fantastic i mean it's really nice weather looking here and there's an atlas on the pad in front of me so it's a good day of course, the weather on the ground is important, but also the weather in the sky, upper level winds. Everyone loves or doesn't really love some upper level wind. So as Alex was just saying, the weather has improved in order for a launch in just 55 minutes time. And uh, yeah, that is a good thing to point out, um, because if you weren't aware that if you were used to just watching SpaceX launches, they tend to just stick with T minus. However, ULA and, and uh, SLS, for example, they like to do built-in holds, which is why an L minus count then becomes a necessity, because if you just use the T minus count, it can get quite confusing very quickly if they are holding and you weren't expecting them to hold, and it can create all, all kinds of confusion, which is why an L minus count is more uh, precise for the actual time until launch. Uh, so uh, fingers crossed 
whilst everything keeps going as expected. And I believe this is our uh, camera on uh, from Max. It's just spilled up there from the press site, looking across the uh, across the uh, uh, Sawyer. What are you looking across? What's the body of water called? Uh, I believe it's the Banana River that we're looking across here, or yeah. It's a little uh, side road kind of uh, tucked away at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station called Loop Road. So I believe that's Banana River between us and all of the launch pads in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have a nice little straight on view there, essentially, as close as you can get. Uh, the uh, big building on the right there with the ULA logo on it, that's the Vertical Integration Facility. That's actually a little way off. It's a little uh, like a slip road kind of for the for the for the rail uh, there, so it's not exactly looking uh, dead down the middle, but it's practically as close as you can get. Uh, it's a pretty cool shot there. And uh, Alex, uh, the, the the venting we're seeing from Atlas at the moment uh, that is all indicating uh, 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 good things so far, correct? Yeah, that is indeed good. That is just basically the the look at auction tank on the Atlas booster is just venting naturally. As it's being topped off, you know, it is it is right now complete. So all it's doing right now is just keeping all of that uh, liquid oxygen inside of the tank. And, you know, you, you kind of need that to be to be vented away as it boils off to keep the pressure at the pressures that you want in the tank, basically. And I should mention, uh, as always, if you have any burning questions that you want us to try and answer, tag us in chat at NASA Spaceflight and then put your question in. And then that will, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the back end here, which will scrape all of those questions and uh, put them into a nice neat order, nice queue. And then we can bring them up one by one. One of those very questions uh, is uh, Kane. Uh, not really a question, just saying glad to have the daytime launches mixed in. And uh, Sawyer, it does make a bit of a change. I think the last daytime launch we had from the Cape was another Atlas. Yeah, the last one we saw was uh, Silent Barker just a short while ago. And prior to that, the last day launch was back on July 1st. So this is only the third since July. Kind of crazy to think about with SpaceX's Starlink launch windows. And uh, Alex Joshua was asking, when did this specific Atlas V roll out to Slick 41? I believe it was yesterday when it rolled out. It was quite, quite quickly in terms of how ULA tends to do their operations. Uh, they normally roll out like several days before the launch and they take a while. But this time around, it seems like they were you know, just pretty much ready to go. And so they rolled out yesterday. And since yesterday, they went right into operations, loading the RP-1 on the first stage. And then they went and cleared the pad and everything and started cryogenic fueling um, this morning. So pretty much just yesterday, basically. Um, obviously, the roll, per se, of the hardware to the pad uh, started about three weeks ago, thereabouts. Uh, with the rollout of the booster, the Centaur, and then the payload fairing with the with the Kuiper satellites on board, uh, which took place within two weeks or so of the of the previous flight, which we saw here just a month and so ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of the Kuiper satellites, Alex, can you give us a little rundown of uh, what exactly is inside the payload fairing and, and where they're trying to get to today? Yeah, I, I, I actually just saw someone asking protoflight. What does that mean, right? Well, <laughs> this mission, uh, yeah. So the, the name is kind of a weird name, to be honest, because uh, it, it, I don't know, in my mind, prototype flight will be m more, I don't know, m m more beautiful than protoflight. But it is indeed uh, just basically the, the two satellites that you know Amazon built, uh, they had for for the Kyber constellation for their um, for it's basically their internet constellation, just like pretty much a Starlink. You see that you know OneWeb. The, there's these companies like OneWeb and IntelSat and things like that. There's all of these other companies trying to make internet satellites, but those are normally looking at other type of, uh, type of customers, while Amazon's Kuiper Constellation is closer to Starlink in the sense that they actually have like a terminal for people to just 
put up and you know have internet at home. Obviously, right now that's that is not the case because they don't have any satellites up there. This is the first launch of those prototype satellites, hence the name Kyber Protoflight for the prototype flight of these two satellites. Now, these two satellites actually came here ar around March, I believe. They were originally going to be launched on Vulcan, on the first flight of Vulcan. But since that launch has been delayed quite a bit um, due to these Centaur 5 problems, etc., etc., we talked about that many, many times before. Also in this week in Spaceflight, by the way, just shout out to, to our new show uh, every Friday. Um, so the launch instead has gone to this Atlas V. And so why launch it on a single Atlas V with nothing else? Well, because they are in a hurry. They basically want to get this, I mean, this is obviously a guess, but if you think about it, when they have contractual obligations, they need to deploy all of the satellites by, I think, July... Uh, I think half of the constellation needs to be deployed by July 2026. So when you think about it, it makes sense for them to try to get the prototype satellites as soon as possible up there so they can test all of the technologies for the full operational satellites to be launched next year and then start you know, pumping out all of these satellites and be able to build up the constellation to meet the, the obligations posed by the Federal Communications Commission. So they basically took one of their already bought flights on, a, on an Atlas V and told Yule, hey, you know, you know, remove all of the solids. We don't need all of that capacity. We're going to fly solo here with just the big slick, as Tori uh, nicknames this configuration, which we, we could talk about that later down the line. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's a question here, actually, uh, uh, asking, or oh, Kane again, asking, uh, what else is Atlas slated for? In the coming 12 months or so. Soya, you're down there at the Cape. Uh, you attend a lot of launches. What else are we looking for from Atlas? I, I think there's a there's a certain internet constellation which may be taking up a few of those flights. Uh, yeah, pretty much most of the uh, Atlas flights here, you've got the Kuiper constellation. It'll be split between that and uh, ULA's next generation rocket, Vulcan, which both launched from 41. Uh, in terms of future flights for Atlas. This is the final of this configuration without any solid rocket boosters. So they will either have a bunch of solid rocket boosters around them, or hopefully next year, fingers crossed, uh, we will have an N-22 configuration, which is for a Boeing Starliner crew capsule with two solids and two upper stage engines. And speaking of 501, Alex, uh, some people may not understand, but it's just some three random numbers. What on earth do they mean? And Doug W is asking, uh, does the 501 SRB have a gimbaled nozzle uh, control to account for the asymmetric thrust? And uh, the numbers are the other way around. The, 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 the SRB number is the one in the middle, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So you can actually see it on the description. We've added stats and things like that. It's kind of a new thing right now. Uh, you can go to the description of the live stream. You can see the explanation of what Atlas V 501 means. In in this case, the five means it is a five meter payload uh, fairing. It is that's the diameter of the fairing. The zero means there are no solar rocket boosters on this rocket, and the one is that basically means that the center upper stage only has one RL10 engine. Now. For example, Sawyer was talking about the N22 configuration. That's going to be the one where Starliner flies on. That's going to have no fair fairing. The N basically stands for no fairing. Uh, the two stands for two solar rocket boosters, and the two at the end stands for two engines on the upper stage of basically the, the Centaur upper stage. Now, when they do have one single engine, uh, one single SRB, excuse me. They do have uh, the, the possibility on the main engine, on the RD-180 uh, engine, they do have the capacity to gimbal the engine in such a way to compensate for a bit of that mm, slide, so to speak, right? Uh, and so they do, they do slide off the pad, though, uh, when, they, when they launch with asymmetrical thrust. So this, we don't have any SRBs on there today. The the, the one in the 501 stands mm. for a single engine on the Centaur upper stage. So if you were confused about that, um, it is a five meter fairing, no solid rocket boosters, and one engine on the Centaur. And in fact, uh, super... 
what that means is that this launch is going to be one of the one of the slowest ascents for for Atlas. So because it doesn't yes. have any SRBs, it's going to creep very slowly off the pad with just that single RD180 engine at the base. So it's going to be amazing. Yeah, that's a thrust to wait ratio for those who like disagree the... with me, but I I prefer the solids because because it leaves a trail behind it. So am, am I wrong? Uh, you are not wrong. The solids do leave a trail, uh, which is pretty awesome. But yeah, the fact that it goes so slow off the pad, for the people that like the Kerbal-type numbers, the thrust-to-weight ratio for this is 1.14. So it's definitely going to take its time crawling up. But you'll still see a decent smoke cloud, just not as defined as, say, the one we saw when there were five solids on the last one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, Supercat asking, uh, how many configurations are there for the Atlas V? Well, I'd say, Alex, theoretically, there could be as many as you want. But, you know, physically, they've only flown a certain a certain number of different variations. Well, there's, there's so many variations because you have all of the different solar rocket boosters, right, that you can put uh, for the 4-meter uh, fairing version, which is not flowing anymore because they have already closed off that that capability, but when they flew with 4-meter fairings, you had 4-meter fairing, you also have the 5-meter fairing, then the the difference between, you know, having 0 SRBs to all the way to 5 SRBs, 1 or 2 engines on the center upper stage, and even then, the different fairings had different lengths. So you had the short, medium, and long versions. In this case of today's flight, the fairing is the short version because they don't need all of the space of a medium or long version of the five meter diameter fairing. So you have so many combinations. It's basically, uh, as they used to say, it's dial in rocket. Basically, you can just change things here and there and make the rocket that, that you want with the performance that you want. I'm trying to do the maths here quickly. It's something like a 60 uh, uh, ish different variants if you count it, all the different fairing sizes mm -hmm. and SRB yeah. config. So, you know, theoretical versions of Atlas that could fly with, oh, there's a big bird there. You know, uh, the, the numbers tick up, but um, I don't believe that many variants have actually flown just because it's easier with a production line to generalize how many things you want to stick to the side of a rocket, especially with asymmetric thrust. Yeah, in fact, I don't think there's been any any use, for example, of the long five meter fairing, because I don't think there's been anything that is so wide, but it's also so long that needs, you know, the, the long five meter diameter fairing for, for Atlas V. I think that's something like 22 meters long or something. That's, that's bonkers. That's, yeah, there's nothing <laughs> out there. Yeah. I mean, unless you want to, you know, launch some, you know, module for the ISS or something that is super, super big. But right now, Atlas V has not made use of that long fairing. And Sawyer, uh, Mr. Vipitus is asking, how many active pads are there at the Cape? And um, the numbers go up quite high, but I don't think there's actually that many launch pads which are actively used. There's also some that are kind of in testing, kind of. Yeah, I mean, they just had a whole bunch of leases that went out, too, to different people, so it, the atmosphere is going to be changing. But we know 39B is NASA, 39A is on loan from NASA for 20 years, at least 10 more for now, to SpaceX. You've got 41, ULA, you've got 40, which is also SpaceX, 37 B, there is no 37A, so just refer to it as 37. That one has one more Delta flight. Uh, so that's ULA. And then there's a bunch of other ones if you go down, including uh, LC-36 now for Blue Origin, which you can see great video and pictures of in our most recent flyover. Uh, you also have Relativity's pad down that way towards the uh, end of the Cape. So there's a lot of pads, uh, but as I mentioned, not all of them are fully occupied at the moment. Yeah, and there's, you know, it seems like every almost every small sat company based in the US has managed to wiggle mm. their way into getting a pad at the Cape. And there's also pads like, uh, I think it's a Launch Complex 46, which can be shared between different types of vehicles. So, you know, yeah. it, it, the definitions can get quite confusing as you, as you keep going down the rabbit hole. I'm just going to hit a bit of uh, support we got uh, before and after we went live. And uh, this... Uh, uh, Tagon has become a red team member. Thanks very much for that. Doug uh, became a pad rat member. RT Horseman, a name we see quite a lot, uh, gifted one red team membership. 
Jim Cavett, another name we see quite a lot, gifting one red team membership. And Spirit Wolf also gifting a red team membership as well. That's a, it's a gifted membership. So I, I quite like the concept because you get to support the channel and there's someone else also gets to have access to a membership. And we have so many gifted memberships. It's just, you know, a very unique program, which I'm quite a fan of. Uh, Mark van der Heide, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, is asking, when do we think New Glenn will fly with Kuiper satellites? This is kind of similar to the when do we think Starship will fly with Starlink satellites. Uh, Alex, Blue Origin and Amazon aren't exactly the same company, but I guess you could kind of say they're sibling companies. So I guess maybe New Glenn flying with Kuiper satellites could be a good test program, maybe? Yeah, they actually have contracts to fly uh, Kuiper satellites on New Glenn. I, th I think they have about a dozen or more of these flights. Um, the only thing is, obviously, when is that going to happen? New Glenn, I believe it is targeting a debut sometime next year, right? Uh, and Noggin Wood, maybe if the flight next year, still they need uh, to ramp up cadence and things like that. They need to fly other customer missions. I believe they have um, a NASA mission as one of the first flights as well. So, you know... Um, I think maybe early 2025 might be the first flights of Kuiper on New Glenn. I think Kuiper is actually targeting Atlas to be the first one to be launching uh, operational satellites. So we have here the prototype flight, right? But then next year, around, I think, spring, I believe they said, thereabouts. Not, don't quote me on that, but I believe their target is for launching the operational satellites around spring of next year on an Atlas V, on these Atlas V launches that they booked a long time ago. And then after that, they also have Vulcan, they also have Ariane 6, and also New Glenn. So New Glenn, I think it's probably going to be in the 2025 time frame for that. Sounds good. Uh, Mark Towner asking, uh, Alex, you were speaking about uh, the different fairing sizes for Atlas earlier on uh mark is asking could falcon 9 use larger fairings and i believe this is this is this is related to a story we covered on this week in spaceflight a few weeks ago indeed yeah so they uh, they have been developing these larger fairings not larger diameter but longer uh fairings actually so i believe that one is around 18 to 19 meters in length which is already quite long to be honest uh, that's that's quite a big fairing. And so um, these longer fairings, they are in development, things like that. The only thing is that we haven't really seen anything other than a side. Like it's, it's, it's sort of like from the front when the, when the fairing was horizontal and getting into a vacuum chamber to be tested. So we really haven't even seen the whole thing. Like we haven't seen it from the side and on its entire length or, or things like that. They're still testing it, it appears. So it's going to be a while. It's going to be used though. We know a few missions at least that need this capability. For example, the launch of the first two gateway modules, Halo and PPE. Those are going to be launched jointly together on the same Falcon Heavy rocket and because they are too long when they are joined together, they need that longer fairing for that Falcon Heavy flight. Whether we're going to see any other mission, for example, we don't really know, but it's something that it's on, on the Falcon 9 Pillow Users Guide, so definitely something available for customers in theory. So mm -hmm. who knows? And uh, ASX has a question here, which I believe Sawyer touched on earlier, but I'll ask it again. Uh, Sawyer, will this flight be the last of the Atlas V in its uh, 501 configuration? That is correct. This is the last time you will see a semi-naked booster in a way, uh, at least in terms of the common core stage there in the middle. Uh, after this, everything will have the solid rocket boosters slash solid rocket motors on the side. And again, Atlas V can go up to five solid rocket motors. As we saw last time, we had the 551, which meant the five meter fairing with five solid rockets and one upper stage Centaur engine. So uh, expect a lot of those. And again, everything also from here on out, if I recall correctly, uh, is five meter fairings as well. So and... I have a bit of an update right now here. Um, if you Go on. if you are just here right now uh, tuning in, Yole has delayed the launch, but just a bit, 
just six minutes instead of being two o'clock it's going to be two six p.m eastern so just by six minutes it's the new t0 for this launch just six so minutes. that adjusts the clock now just over 40 minutes to go so not the mm -hmm. biggest hold in the world but they are they obviously just want to take a little bit more time uh, with the countdown and how everything is proceeding and uh, Mark asking another question Alex I'll throw this to you how does Falcon 9 compare to Atlas 5 with the largest fairing and the max solid uh, rocket boosters well in terms of, of performance uh, Falcon 9 is more akin to an Atlas 5 with two solid rocket boosters more or less uh, in the this configuration of Atlas 5 is more like Falcon 9 with RTLS ish kind of because uh, now with Falcon 9, you know, being able to do RTLS with even crew missions, it's more like uh, the Atlas V with maybe one solid rocket booster uh, in terms of the performance equivalence. Now, the Atlas V with the largest fairings and mad solid uh, fuel boosters and things like that, that is more akin to a Falcon Heavy with, you know, RTLS on the side boosters and expendable center core. So it's pretty much like that in terms of performance. Obviously, Falcon Heavy has more room to be expand, uh, you know, to expand on that performance by expanding the side boosters as, as well and be able to, you know, push further some of these uh, payloads, which is why it's, its performance is larger than the Atlas V for, for pretty much all of the, you know, normal orbits that one can think of and all of the normal payloads that one can think of. Um, you know, one one can go into a huge debate here of whether one is more perform has more performance or the other, but that's a long debate there. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to hit this quickly. Astro Medic becoming a Capcom member that means you get access to the Discord server and you can see all what goes on down there. It's probably the best, in my opinion, not bias, <laughs> the best space community there is. It's a huge server full of loads of space geeks, so you'll probably enjoy that. Uh, Blush becoming a red, uh, gifting, rather, one red team membership. And Dean has gifted five red team memberships. Thanks very much for all of those. If you got one of them, make sure to thank uh, the uh, contributor in chat. Uh, uh, let's go to uh, this question here. Uh, Adam asking, uh, how many more Atlas V launches are left before it gets retired? Soya, do you know off the top of your head uh, roughly how many Atlas Vs we've still got to see launch? There's still quite a few. It's uh, seven. Yeah, I'm getting confirmation from Max. There are 17 left. You've got uh, pretty much all the 550 ones like I was just talking about or ones reserved for Starliner. Yes. Sounds good. Nicholas is asking, uh, with Atlas V being bifueled uh, with uh, RP-1 and uh, uh, liquid hydrogen uh, for the Centaur, does that make the pad infrastructure uh, complicated? Uh, well, Alex, I would have guessed, even if you're just using, say, RP-1 and LOX, the pad infrastructure is still complicated. Um, <laughs> so um, what, what is the complexity of throwing in liquid hydrogen as well? Well, it does simplify things a lot when you have um, just the same propellant across the board, because you don't need to have, you know, expertise in another kind of, you know, in another kind of propellant or anything like it. Like, because when you have to deal with liquid hydrogen, the folks that you have at the pad to work on those hydrogen systems are folks that know about the hydrogen systems, right? The, the folks that work on the engines, for example, the only thing here, obviously, the engines are outsourced. So that's a thing that ULA can save from that. Um, but if you have all of the engines in-house, for example, it's really good to have your own propellant across the board so you don't need to change between here and there. Now, obviously, there are there are convenience. Uh, there, there is a convenience from from having a hydrogen upper stage, which is, which is basically that increased ISP, the, the specific impulse on the on the engine. The upper stage is also lighter because it's not as heavy as a kerosene uh, rocket uh, booster or rocket stage, right? So your booster can have flight that is much longer, that is basically. With a with a smaller engine, so overall, for example, this kind of Atlas right now, when it lifts off and ignites that RD-180 engine, it's going to have half the thrust of a Falcon 9, but it will have about the same performance of a Falcon 9 with RTLS. So at the end of the day, if you think about it, if you just want a smaller rocket, 
you don't need that much of a of a big of a rocket, then that's sort of your trade off here. Bit more complication on the GSC, but you get a smaller rocket and other and other nice things to have. And I'll also throw in the fact that uh, Slick Forty One is a shared pad between Vulcan and Atlas Five, and Vulcan is a is a methane liquid oxygen mm. vehicle. So not only do we have Atlas Five using RP One liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, you then also have an entirely different rocket using an entirely different fuel as well. So you yeah. know if if Slick Forty One wasn't complicated already, it certainly is when you've got when you've got three fuels and liquid oxygen thrown in there as well. Uh, Astro Three Die, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, is asking if it hadn't been for using a Russian engine, do you think ULA would have stuck with upgrading the Atlas Five rather than developing Vulcan? Well, Sawyer, what, what, what's your take on that? Should you uh, do you think ULA would have stuck with upgrading Atlas Five rather than developing Vulcan? I mean, a reminder that uh, this decision to transition over to Vulcan was made well before the current Russian-Ukraine conflict. So that's not as much of a factor for ULA as it is for, say, um, Northrop Grumman with the Antares. But at this point, again, it's you're trying to find the most efficient fuels that you can. And now that uh, methane is becoming a lot more, I don't want to say common, it's uh, finding a way to harness its energy better uh, it's become more popular anyway so at that point why not use it and uh uh terra space is asking does atlas 5 have any similarities to nasa's old titan rocket uh alex there are there are many 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 variants of the titan uh which launched from this very area of the cape uh are there any similarities left over or is there just some kind of is it just like the name centaur has stuck around well, apart from, yeah, as you mentioned, having the center upper stage on both rockets, other than that, the Titan rocket, for example, unless you count the Titan one, the rest of the Titan rockets had hypergolic on uh, the hypergolic propellants on the first stage. If you remember, for example, the later Titans had these big solar rocket boosters on the sides that actually did mo most of the of the job of lifting off the pad, and then the, the, the booster stage will be air, air um Airlit, uh, basically in air. So there's there's many many differences between both rockets. The only commonality basically is just having a stage on top of the booster that is called Centaur. Uh, is the only thing that I can think of that is similar. Maybe the mm -hmm. manufacturing process in some shape or form might be com common. I don't really know because I don't really know that much into th those rockets to know that. But definitely similarities and very quickly. And John is asking, Sawyer, I'll throw this to you. Why didn't NASA select Atlas V to launch Psyche, which is launching on a Falcon Heavy next week? And uh, just thinking back, it's launched, it launched the Perseverance rover, it launched Osiris Rex. Why couldn't it launch Psyche? Uh, well, it comes down to the spacecraft that you're launching more so than the vehicle in this case. It's a big satellite it's on the slightly heavier side so for something like that you go for the falcon heavy which has a little bit more lift capacity and also again the fact that pretty much all the atlas fives at this point onward are on reserve so uh yeah it, they couldn't even pull one aside if they wanted to switch that's good Again, I'll, I'll mention it again. If you have a question that you want us to try and answer, we've got a few coming into the queue here. Tag us in chat at NASA Spaceflight. It will come up into the, into the queue here and uh, we'll uh, go through them as uh, best uh, as, as we can. And we're just hearing from ULA now that the weather remains go for launch at six minutes past the top of the hour, which is in just uh, under... 32 minutes time so don't go anywhere that time uh if you are just tuning in now has slipped six minutes to the right it was initially going for the opening of the window which was the dead top of the hour uh, uh 1800 universal time but that's just gone six minutes to the right we're now targeting 1806 utc and uh, Khaled is asking, how many satellites are launching? Alex, how many satellites are inside this uh, proto-flight, as it's being called? Yeah. Well, um, there are two, officially, right? There's been so many jokes about this launch being so secretive, because we really haven't seen pictures of these two satellites. 
or even you know pictures of the inside of the payload fairing or what else is going on with this racket. So there's been a lot of you know joke conspiracy theories, not real conspiracy theories, obviously that there's going to be some kind of hidden satellite or something. Uh, but no, for for all we know, it's not really launching anything else than those two Kuiper prototype uh, satellites. And uh, DYU89 uh, is <laughs> with a five dollar super chat is saying, Alexa, where are my satellites? <laughs> I've seen a lot of that going around on Twitter lately. Uh, so thank you very much for that super chat. And of course, everybody who is contributing through that manner, super chats and and door messages and tips and, and gifted memberships and things like that, it is it is very much appreciated uh for everything everything that comes in and even, even everybody just watching it is great because if you weren't watching we'd just be talking to absolutely nobody and that wouldn't be any fun so thanks everybody for tuning in uh terra space another great question asking uh uh here uh have a couple atlas fives been reserved for nasa's sample return mission uh from mars now soya that's a mission that uh, seems to keep having its budget increased is are there any atlas fives reserved for that I don't believe so. I don't think they have it reserved for that. I'm not sure if they've even selected a vehicle, and if so, it might even be um, ESA that does that, so it might be Ariane, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Yeah, the um, the number of, of rockets right now ever reserved for that mission is zero. Like, any rocket right now is is not being really reserved for that kind of mission. And Atlas mm -hmm. V, not, there's not going to be any more Atlas Vs being sold out. But right now, Atlas V is completely sold. Uh, there's not going to be any more Atlases being sold to any other customers. So we have nine copper flights, eight uh, Starliners, I believe, or rather seven now, because they already launched one. And there's going to be one um, via set mission. So apart from that, you know, it's already counted for. So it's there's going to be any ULA rocket supporting that mission. It might only be Vulcan. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel is asking, uh, VAB squeal today or not? Now, Soyo, you're not stood next to the VAB at the at the ULA press site. Um, so it's going to be hard to tell. But that's a Falcon 9 only thing, really, uh, if I'm correct. Yeah, it has a lot to do with the Merlin 1D engines and the frequency at which they vibrate in terms of making their way across the water over to where the press site is and then hitting the VAB. We are not near the vehicle assembly building at this point. Again, that is technically NASA side. We are the U.S. Space Force side here. Um, so, I mean, maybe the VIF will rattle a little bit next to the uh, rocket. That's that vertical integration facility where they stack it before they then roll it out on train tracks out to the pad. But... No squeal from here, but we do hopefully get a great sound because you know how you get the honk with the uh, Raptors, you get the VAB squeal with the Merlins, but you still get a nice deep roar when the RD-180s come to life. So right before ignition, uh, when the sound hits us at least, you get a sort of whack in the chest before you actually get the sound. It's going to be that whoop, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. Uh, let's see here, if you're looking through the question queue. Uh, I'll hit this one from Paul, uh, a $5 super chat. Thanks very much for that. Is there a standard for mounting payloads onto the rocket, or is there a unique design for each one? Uh, Alex, is there like a common payload adapter, or is it different for each rocket? Well, there are, there are certain uh, standard attachment uh, for in, in spaceflight. There's, you know, the, the, the usual... Probably some people in the audience might have heard about this, the ESPA rings that are called. Uh, but other than that, I, I'm not sure if there's any other standard for attaching payloads into, in, into rockets or things like that. And then each rocket has its own payload adapter where you have the mounting, you know, the mounting hardware on top of that payload adapter. And then the payload adapter uh, basically is attached to the upper stage of that rocket. So other than that, I don't think if there's maybe any other standard, um, not fully sure. Uh, John is asking, what is the gray building on the right side of the of the shot? 
uh, or whose it is. Uh, now, Sawyer, I'll throw this to you because you're there. There's like a, a like a, a, a whitish looking building with the ULA logo on it, but then there's also a building further to the right of that, which is kind of like a grayish color. What, what are those buildings there? Uh, those are a lot of other U.S. Space Force vehicles that, uh, you know, companies end up renting out as well. A lot of those are used for um, certain preparations and integrations of payloads before rolling out. I don't know the exact use of that specific building, but there's a lot of them popped up around most of the pads here. A lot of them still say USAF from when was, this was an Air Force base prior to becoming Space Force. Mm -hmm. and close to that location is also the, the SpaceX uh, payload fairing, um, not the payload fairing, the payload processing facility, excuse me, which is used for mostly customer missions, but also some Starlink missions as well. Uh -huh. Sounds cool. Let's see here. Uh, uh, composite content is asking why does ULA not offer rideshare when Rocket Lab, Ariane Space, and SpaceX do offer it? Uh, Alex, uh, do you want to tackle that one? I'm not sure if they actually don't share it or just that they don't really have the market for it because I don't think ULA really specializes in that kind of thing with rideshares and things like that. I do know that, for example, uh, for NASA missions, they have. You, you know, they have to have the the availability to have rideshares because NASA, a long time ago, I think uh, 10 or so years ago, started to have this sort of rule that whenever they hire any sort of like, you know, they, they contract any sort of mission to deep space, then they need to have some kind of rideshare on the mission. So they do need to have that capability for NASA. But other than that, I don't think that's actually the specialty um, apart from, you know, those government missions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are scrolling through the socials or whatever and you see anybody saying that we're at T-minus four minutes and holding, uh, that is correct because uh, unlike, say, SpaceX, uh, ULA uh, actively uses an, an L-minus and a T-minus countdown. So the L-minus is the time to launch. The T-minus is the is is a account that can have built in holds so uh ula is in a planned pre-scheduled t minus four minutes hold this is bad or anything this is completely planned and normal and what we should be expecting and we expect them to resume that count in 20 what would it be in just over 19 minutes time uh which is when hey, Ryan, the, may I jump uh, in a quick sec? go on sawyer uh, I was just going to say, in regards to that previous question, uh, Julia tweeted out to Tori Brunos, the, uh, basically the head of ULA, asking about the whole rideshare question, if there's anything else in there. Uh, it is just the two Kuiper satellites, uh, which do not take up the entire fairing, per his response to Julia, that just came in on Twitter. Yeah, or this was... X or Twix. Yeah, this was in general, like, why ULA does not offer rideshare, not about this particular mission being a rideshare or not. Like in general, whether yeah, they the conversation. Do not... it worked yeah, out perfectly yeah, yeah. that Julie was asking that, so I figured I'd uh, <laughs> chime in with that while we're at a hold. And that also goes into what you were but... saying earlier, Alex, that this the this was kind of a uh, say an accelerated process to launch. They just kind of stuck the the pay uh, the payload on whatever rocket they kind of mm -hmm. had lying around and ready to go. Yeah, and speaking of of that, um, the latest update when ULA, you know gave the update that they were holding the planned hold, by the way. Not, it's not that they're delaying or anything. It's still on track for 2.06 p.m. Eastern. But normally these built-in holds are about 30 minutes in duration. And in fact, their update says 21 minutes. So they seem to have been tweaking this, this countdown. It's, it's like, even though this is the 99th launch of Atlas V, they're still tweaking the countdown for some reason. But hey, not going to complain. Better to not wait out those extra nine minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, the more data you get with every flight, the more things you can optimize. That's why we've been able to mm -hmm. see Falcon 9 boosters return uh, through a return to launch site recovery um, for crew missions now because SpaceX have had so many flights that they have all the data and they can optimize that vehicle as much as possible with little incremental upgrades here and there. And uh, tying into that, uh, Mike is asking, what parts of this will be reused? And Sawyer, the Atlas V uh is uh let's say apart from the starliner configuration this is a fully expendable vehicle correct yeah uh, it falls into the category of eelv the last elv standing for expendable launch vehicle so 
Uh, no parts of these are reused, but again, a lot of the stuff that splashes down into the ocean, if it survives, don't worry, it's not like it's pollution or all that. A lot of them end up actually becoming natural reefs. So you'll, if you find a lot of rocket parts down in the water, you'll see some of the uh, underwater life has kind of used it to attach onto. And as again, a mini reef, places for fish to make their nests if they do that nesting thing. Again, I'm not a biologist. I just do rocket science. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Me if your too. rocket is a Saturn V, then maybe a few years later, a few decades later, actually, maybe the boss of this company, Amazon, goes and fish out uh, one of the <laughs> one of the engines for that mission. <laughs> I still remember when when he <laughs> did that. Boy, <laughs> brilliant! I think that ended up in the in the Smithsonian. I think because I think I saw that. Let's see here. Yeah, when when people say uh, you know Alt F four, in this case, he went Saturn five F one. <laughs> and don't press Alt F four, by the way, it will close your browser. Please don't do that. <laughs> Enzo is asking, is the Vulcan rocket almost ready? Well, Alex, we saw we saw it static fire on the pad, and then it rolled back, and then we saw Tori tweeting about something to do with the Centaur upper stage quite a bit. Yeah, it is. It is sort of ready right now. As you mentioned, the the upper stage that Centaur Five upper stage is being ready to be shipped. I believe they are planning to ship that next month, and then stack the whole rocket together, roll it out, and then they might be doing testing. I'm not fully sure if they're going to be any any doing testing, or just go straight with you know mounting the payload on top and roll it out for for launch but definitely that launch is being planned for the middle of december right now but as mm -hmm. always it's a space flight don't be surprised if there's any delays yeah rockets virtually never move to the left you should always expect rocket launches to move to the right that's uh that's just what they like to do unfortunately but it's the name of the game let's see through here uh, Matrix is asking, is there now an area off the coast of Florida that has a ton of old rockets making one big natural reef area? Uh, well, Sawyer, to the point you were making, uh, yes, they can become natural reefs once they splash into the ocean, but not every rocket is going in the same direction at the same speed, is it? Well, they all splash down kind of in different locations. So yeah, like even if you think about it, if you see the Starlink launches, SpaceX tends to deorbit those second stages down by the... Uh, tip of South Africa. Some of them will end up around uh, the tip of South America down that way as well. But there's also a point where they try and get rid of all the big junk, especially from space that's already launched, and that's called Point Nemo, the farthest point away from any land in the middle of the ocean. So uh, based on the trajectory, yeah, you kind of get a few that end up in the relative same area, but it's not like there's a whole pile of them stacked on top of each other right off the coast here. Yeah. And again, if you have a question, tag us in chat at NASA Space Flight. It will come into the queue here. I'm sorting through them, looking at what to bring up next. Uh, uh, such as uh, this one from Brian asking, is that the VAB to the right? It makes the rocket look tiny. Uh, and uh, Sawyer, you're not positioned at the uh, Launch Complex 39 press site, are you? You're a little way, uh, you're, you're not on Kennedy Space Center property. That is correct. Yeah, we are uh, on the United States Space Force side here. Uh, formerly Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, now Space Force Station. Uh, the VAB is kind of visible off in the far distance, but no, these are uh, former Air Force current Space Force buildings over here. And uh, we just have an update from ULA here saying that the Anomaly team is looking at a valve and they will report back good old valves. Everyone loves a good valve. Uh, where it was a valve that's uh, delayed the first Starship flight, I think. Yeah. Everyone loves everyone loves valves. So it's yeah, we we'll obviously valve. have to. It's always a valve. We have to keep an eye on that uh, as it goes through. And I'm seeing some store orders coming in as well. Uh, so if you oh. uh, want to want to purchase something off the store, uh, uh, shop.nasaspaceflight.com. When you go to the checkout, there's actually a box where I'm alive. Uh, so if you want to leave a message, you can. So that is also another option alongside all the the super the super chats and such. Matt asking, uh, Alex, I'll toss this one over to you. Why is the RP-1, the kerosene, loaded so early on this rocket? If I recall correctly, it was already fully loaded yesterday, which is mm -hmm. you know 24 hours before launch. Yeah, so um, 
One of the reasons is because they can, and the reason why they can do it is because it is not loaded at, you know, at lower temperatures than room temperature like Falcon 9. Um, Falcon 9, they load the, the, the RP-1 kerosene is loaded about minus 6 uh, degrees Celsius, which will be about 20 Fahrenheit. Um, so it's colder than room temperature, right? Especially way colder than room temperature in Florida, because room temperature in Florida, I think it's way hotter than 20 Fahrenheit. <laughs> but um, yeah, in, in the case of Atlas V, though, since it doesn't use that that colder kerosene, they can just load it the day before and you know not need to, to worry about it until pretty much the the end of the countdown or so when they do a, f a few tests of that of that system but other than that it's not really uh, a big issue once you once you load it the day before you can forget about it and john is asking uh, other than lightning protection this is a classic nsf question what are the functions of the four towers uh, and what are the white tubes so yeah i'll toss this one down to you at the cape what 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 are the four towers for why are there four towers yeah, uh, I'm sure people are already putting the command in chat, but the four towers, as you mentioned, are related to the lightning system. So contrary to what you think, those white towers are not actually what's meant to deal with the lightning itself. It's actually these small catenary wires that go around it. It kind of forms like a frame essentially around the rocket that Atlas punches through. Uh, so it would hit those and then spiral down and away to be grounded elsewhere so that it doesn't strike your rocket and cause potential electrical or physical damage. In fact, we have a video about that uh, that we released, I think, about a year ago, uh, featuring Chris G back when he was with, with us. We miss you. Uh, but definitely, you, you can check it out by uh, having the command towers, uh, exclamation mark towers. So on, on chat, and then it pops up. I think people are already uh, plugging it in, in in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I would make the argument that the, the crew access tower should count as a fifth tower, so there are no longer four towers, which means... And now Slick 40 is getting its, its crew tower. That means that no longer has four towers. So the days of four towers are over. You can argue with that in chat as much as you wish, but that's just, you know... Trying to spoil the fun here. <laughs> it's it's now five towers. What are the five towers? Uh, Apocalypse Cow is uh, has gifted ten red team memberships. Thank you very much to, for uh, that. And of course, if you if you received one of them, make sure to give them a thank you in chat as well. And uh, uh, let's have a look through here for some questions. And uh, uh, Twitch is asking. Uh, quick question, did I hear kerosene or am I having audible hallucinations? Uh, you heard correctly, Alex, this is this has got kerosene in the first stage, hasn't it? Yes, it is actually a refined form of kerosene, it's called Rocket Propellant 1, RP1, and it is basically just just as you heard, it is a refined version of, the, of kerosene, just like the one that, that you know planes use, but it is a bit more refined for the use on rockets. I believe the one used on 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 planes, it's called like Jet A, I believe, is the technical term. Uh, but yes. it's it's a it's a, yeah it's it's a form of kerosene. It's a refined form of kerosene. Very it's cheap. a lot nicer than the stuff you put in your car. Yeah, <laughs> you, you you wouldn't be able to put that on on these rockets. No. <laughs> Wait, you put kerosene in your car, not petrol or gas? It's, it's diesel. It's a form of kerosene. Right? There were there were attempts wrong? to make gasoline rocket engines though at, at, at one point, but that didn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> if you try loading your car with RP one, I do wonder what would happen, although your engine would probably just combust. Maybe we need yeah. to make a video about that. Okay, moving on, moving on. <laughs> Uh, uh, ULA uh, have confirmed uh, uh, when we were just going through uh, L minus 14 minutes to go a few minutes ago uh, that they were still on track for six minutes past the top of the hour 1806 universal time so we are still on track uh, for the second T0 which they published today if you are just joining us uh, uh, right now and you weren't tuning in earlier and you're expecting the launch to be in five minutes time well they've pushed it six minutes uh, they haven't said why but the uh, just the name of the game of rockets it is now six minutes past the top of the hour and you are are not tracking any problems with atlas 5 centaur all the payload at this time at least what they're telling us so all looks good for a launch in just uh uh over 10 minutes time here and uh also uh, uh 
some some cool stats for you here. This will be the 99th flight of the Atlas V. And if you want to count the entire Atlas family since when the first Atlas launched back in uh, 1957, which is a very long time ago, this will be the 681st flight of a rocket that has an Atlas in its name, which is just kind of a mind-boggling fact to think about. Over 680 Atlases since the dawn of the space age. Take with that information what you will. And if you want more facts, there's uh, more more stats. I, I mean, there are, there are more in the in the description of the video. There's things like mm -hmm. this is a, the the third launch for ULA this year. It is the 158th launch overall for the company. And if you can. Is, you can see the third stats there. It says ULA's 74th launch from Sleek 41, but the 82nd Atlas V. That is because when Atlas V started flying, it was under Lockheed Martin, not under ULA. ULA came when Atlas V was already flying a few times. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an amalgamation with them and uh, Boeing, I believe. Kind of like a... Uh, uh, kind of like a... Let's come together and make a big rocket company kind of thing, make it cool, give it a new name, stuff like that. You mean like an alliance that uh, they would launch under Together United? Uh, maybe something along those lines, Sawyer, maybe. <laughs> Although I'm not sure. <laughs> I may have done the acronym sure backwards ALU. there, but you know, they should, not... <laughs> they should have called it ALU instead of ULA. There you go. I'm not sure if ALU would, would roll off the tongue as easily, uh, uh, but you know, hey ho, ULA. Your ULA just works. Your ULA just works. You want to know something else that just works? Uh, that would be our merch store, shop.nasaspaceflight.com. That is the place where you can get any of your spaceflight uh, uh, goodies that you want, especially some metal prints if you're an Atlas V fan. From This is from the Silent Barker launch taken by Max. It's absolutely gorgeous photo if it all load. Uh, I said it. I said the shop just works. Obviously, isn't on Patrick's computer. Uh, anyways, the Atlas V uh, metal prints look pretty good. We also have some new Starship uh, prints on there as well, especially one of the Cybertruck with the Arvac there, taken by Sean down in Starbase the other day. Absolutely stunning photograph. I know many many members of the team here have ordered that to put it on their respective walls. Uh, so many different items you can get. Shop.nasaspaceflight.com that should uh, work fine just for you there. And as I said before, if you order whilst we are live, it will come into our support queue, same as any super chats or anything. So as well as, you know, buying something, you can also get your question read out on, on the live stream. So, you know, ma many different options for you over there. Let's have a look, see if there are any more questions as we uh, approach the, 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 the end of the count here, uh, the, as we are just L minus eight minutes to go. Uh, they One will be polling the... very shortly uh, at uh, L minus seven minutes. Uh, so uh, I'll just see if there's anything we can answer very quickly before we get into that. Uh, Alex, very quickly, Matrix is asking, is there a crew escape zip line or slip and slide on this launch tower? Yep, Count. there is. And there we can see the preparation. engineers and managers are polled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check for all Atlas vehicle systems, ground systems, spacecraft, and the U.S. Space Force Eastern Range. Those like grey box uh, text, they will fill in as they say they are go to go for launch. We're expecting that to start in just about ten seconds' time. Hopefully. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas system propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems propulsion. Go. Pneumatic. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GC cube. Go. Op support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilical. Go. DCS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch direct. You have permission to launch. 
proceeding with the count. There you go, the big words. We are go for launch in just under six minutes time. It, at L minus four minutes, ALC, the T minus clock. Verified. And there you go, they're just verifying that the launch time is uh, six minutes past 1800 coordinated universal time. At L minus four minutes, the T minus clock uh, will catch up as they exit the planned hold. And from there, it will be a T minus clock all the way down to T zero. Uh, at which point the, uh, the the vehicle should hopefully be lifting off of the pad. Just under five and a half minutes to go now. You can see that uh, the, 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 the core there, very, very frosty, full of liquid oxygen. I'm sure the centaur will be pretty cold as well, but the centaur, Alex, I believe, is actually inside, kind of within the payload mm -hmm. fairing uh, on the five meter uh, variant here. It is on 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 this Atlas five five meter fairing uh, diameter. It is actually inside of the fairing. You see there the venting continuing. Still some birds keeping a look at around the uh, the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida. As we now approach T uh, L minus four and a half minutes, just thirty seconds, uh, thirty five seconds until the T minus clock. People are the saying in chat that we didn't pull ourselves, but I'm go for this launch. I'm go. I'm go. Sawyer, I don't know if you're go. I should probably send you off so you can. You go in the field. I, I'll send you off now anyway, so you can uh, you can uh, uh, hopefully get some nice photos of, of this launch. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'll be back on after to talk about it. But go Atlas, go Centaur, go Protoflight. Go and go Sawyer. Moments. Let's listen in for the end of the. And I believe that now means that the terminal count is now rolling. Under four minutes to go now until the launch of Project Kuiper Proto Flight on this Atlas Five Five Zero One. If you are just joining us in the in the top end of the count here, the launch director has verified that we are go for launch at six minutes past the top of the hour. The weather is go, the launch directors go, uh, we're go. So fingers crossed the launch should be coming very, very shortly. Someone mentioning here about the hydrogen on the Centaur uh, potentially leaking into the fairing. Actually, the fairing has vents to deal with that. And also, they have a pipe that sticks out of the fairing. So you will see that as Atlas V lifts off, you will see something sticking out of the fairing. That's normal. That's actually a vent for the Centaur mm -hmm. LH2 tank. And very quickly, before we get into the final minute or so of the count here, whilst we've got some uh, still some time to breathe, even though the adre adrenaline is uh, increasing. Uh, Alex, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat uh, member. And we also have William purchasing a couple items off of the store saying, go Atlas, go Centaur, go Kuiper. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, those purchases off the store there, it is greatly appreciated. Uh, uh, and we are now just over, uh, just under rather, two and a half minutes to go until liftoff. It looks a little bit windy on the ground there, Alex. What do you think? But yeah, the, the weather is go, so I, I'm going to take it that Atlas is good to fly in these conditions. Just a little bit of a light breeze there with the branches uh, waving around. Yeah, that's normal. That's that's something that, that Atlas V can deal with. The problem will be if, if that tree were, were to be a bit more horizontal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as we approach T0... Uh, there's a few things you want to be looking out for. First of all, will be the ignition of the RD-180 engine on that core stage. There are no solid rocket boosters on this variant. There are no solids to be looking out for at the point of liftoff. So if you're Launch getting your hopes up for some solid action, that's not, to, that's not happening today. So once that RD-180 ignites... FCSR. Up, uh, Minus nine in. The okay. And then once that engine ignites, it'll uh, uh, ramp up and then fingers crossed lift off and those umbilicals as well, they'll detach, which are currently hooking it up to the uh, transporter, uh, which uh, rolls it from the vehicle uh, vertical integration facility down to Slick 41. 
60 seconds to go right now. Getting excited now. Rain the green. And there you go. That was the range. The Space Force saying that they are uh, they are good to go. Everybody seems good to go. Everybody's happy. Nothing indicating that we can't launch today. So in just over 30 seconds time, we should be seeing the launch. Here you go then. 25 seconds to go now. 20 seconds. Keep your fingers crossed, everybody. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We should have ignition. And lift off. We are off and away with Project Kuiper Protoflight on an Atlas V 501. Sending it up into low Earth orbit. Let's listen in for the sound. One minute and 40 seconds into flight, you can still hear that kerosene crackle going in the background. Absolutely beautiful sound here as the, the vapor trail now starts to become visible. That RD-180 engine doing, doing a good job of, uh, of lighting up the Floridian skies here, even though it is just past midday. You can see the, the little trail there. Not as good as a solid rocket booster trail that we get, but you know, I'll take it either way. Just over two minutes now. Onboard shots here. Oh, look at this! Absolutely beautiful shot. Wow, that's amazing. Coming from south of the Cape here, as the Atlas V 501 sends it really full throttle, heading down range here, almost horizontal already. I believe this is coming uh, from our friend over on Twitch, uh, Doctor WD40. Thank you very much for this. Providing us with this beautiful feed here of the Atlas V. And this is from uh, our auto track camera at the uh, LC39 press site, which has got a, a wonderful kind of tail on view here as we're three always, minutes into flight. I always love that expansion of the exhaust as it goes up. Yeah. And that's as the, uh, the atmospheric pressure reduces as you get higher. Should be coming up soon on the payload fairing separation, if I'm not mistaken. There you go on the left. That was that's uh, uh, auto track from the Cape, and then on the right, now full screen. This is from uh, Doctor WD40 on Twitch. So yeah, as we wait for payload uh, fairing jettison, that was quite loud, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that was a that was a nice one. Again, the that roar at the very beginning is the first thing you hear. Once you that hits you, you know it's really good. But yeah, the wasn't as super vibration because again, no solids. But boy, that thing took it nice and slow, which meant the sound that did come just stayed at a constant level for quite a while. That was 
Oh, goodbye five oh ones, but that was phenomenal still. And those payload fairings are no longer on the on on the on the vehicle. Yeah, they are approaching right now. Beacon, booster engine cut off. Mm, about thirty seconds from now. Faint that little, light. Distance. Yeah, that little white speck in the middle. If you're watching yep. in HD, you can just see it. And we've got onboard cameras back from ULA. This is one of the rarer vehicles, I believe, that uh, jettisons its payload fairing whilst the first stage is still firing. Yep. And it's four and a half minutes into flight and still, you know, firing that booster. Not for long, too, but yeah. And there we have it. Yeah, DASA's favorite view on launch day. That is an empty Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. On that pad, just five minutes ago, we had an Atlas V-501. That Atlas V-501 is now sending two Kuipersats up into orbit. I believe we should. Uh, they are expecting to be delivered to a 500 kilometer, 30 degree low Earth orbit. Uh, so definitely make sure to check into uh, this week in space flight next week. I'm sure Alex and Alicia will be uh, 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 talking slash writing about that respectively. This launch in particular. Wonderful, wonderful shot here. And fingers crossed, this is the start of many more launches to come. Because, you know, in, in, a, in a world where, where Starlink kind of dominates the internet satellite market, I, I'm not sure if it would be that much of a bad thing to have a, a strong competitor uh, in, in kind of the same space. We have OneWeb, but, you know, they're, they're, they're more dedicated in offering their services to internet service providers rather than the consumer themselves. So, you know, I think it might be nice for Amazon to kind of see if they can challenge Starlink whatsoever, but they have a... Starlink has a pretty long lead that anyone needs to try and uh, catch up on. So um, I, w I wish them the best of luck. And hopefully that this flight, the Project Kuiper Proto flight, is the first launch of many Kuiper satellites to come. Uh, a, a question here from Robert. Alex, um, uh, if you know the answer. Uh, what was the thing sticking out of the rocket uh, okay. just after liftoff on the left side it looks like an umbilical that did not disconnect correctly what was that that is precisely what i talked about i think it was about t minus th three minutes that uh the centaur because it is inside of the pellet fairing you need a vent to be able to connect the the umbilicals to the to the center upper stage to be able to con to retrieve the liquid hydrogen venting from the hydrogen tank on the center upper stage. I believe that's a replay of this launch, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, that, that vent that sticks out, that is actually a a normal thing. It's not that there's being a, a, an umbilical not disconnecting. That is actually a thing that is part of the fairing of Atlas V with a five meter fairing diameter. Very cool. And uh, uh, Hazelnut is asking, what do the kilometers slash degree numbers mean? Sawyer, before I uh, uh, I assume you will have to uh, skedaddle out of the press site pretty quickly, uh, but what, what does kilometers mean? One more time, what was the question there? Sorry? What do the kilometers and degrees mean in an orbit? Uh, let's, uh, how high it is. So you'll hear sometimes two different ones. That's the highest point and the lowest point in its orbit. If it's circular, then it'll just be, you know, 500 kilometer circular orbit. And the degrees is inclination. So that's how angled it is. If you launch it due east of the equator, it's zero degrees. Uh, and then based off of angles from there, you can kind of work out up to polar, which would be 180 degrees. Sounds good. And with that, I'm going to thank you very much, Sawyer. Uh, I'm also going to uh, thank uh, uh, Max, who is out in the field, along with Julia as well, uh, at the press site. Well, we also had uh, further down south, we had uh, Dr. WD40, check them out on Twitch, uh, uh, providing us with that feed there of the Atlas so 5. Say, and, uh, and I was going to say, they all say you're welcome and still love how you say boosta. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, uh, Alex, thank you very much for joining me on commentary for today's launch. It was a pleasure.
And uh, also, Patrick, thank you very much for pushing all the buttons, making things, making photons flow. So everybody could see this launch today. My name is Ryan Caton on behalf of NSF. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. And we'll see you later. Goodbye. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Nothing to be exciting in the flare.